Hello everyone and welcome to another video presentation courtesy of the University of North Texas Physics Department with the assistance of the Physics Demo Room. My name is Corey Dove and I'm going to be assisting with today's demo dealing with the concept of simple harmonic motion. Now simple harmonic motion is a special case of what a lot of us probably see in everyday life of harmonic motion. So harmonic motion is just a pattern that repeats at given time intervals. It can have any shape to it. It can look like a nice triangle. It can look sporadic or it looks like it's kind of a goofy shape, almost like a mountain range. Uh, but that's harmonic because it's happening at the, exact, at the exact time interval with the exact same shape. A simplified version of harmonic motion is called simple harmonic motion. It means that it has to obey sinusoidal functions all the time. And with what we kind of experience in that in physics is that a perfect example of simple harmonic motion has to be with springs. And in this case, we look to Hooke's law, which is right behind me, that F, or the force on the spring, or the force in general, is equal to negative of the spring constant, usually called K, times X, being the position in this case, or the displacement. So with this law, we can see that, okay, if we're always looking at a restoring force, is that we're moved away from the equilibrium and we have a force that wants to restore it back to its normalcy. So I talked about that with this case, we're looking at springs. But if we look at what is the idea of force, well, force is really equal to the mass times the acceleration of an object. Well, the mass times acceleration, acceleration is really the change in velocity with respect to time. But velocity is also the change of position with respect to time. So it's like the double change of position with the double change with respect to time. And you have now this double change of our original function called the x with respect to time has to equal the original function, just with a different constant. Oh, well, this is kind of interesting. We have a function that's equal to the negative of, it's kind of like the exact same of um, the secondary function again. When we change it twice, we get the exact same original function. And I talked about before that simple harmonic motion obeys the sinusoidal function or the sinusoidal pattern. Well, that sinusoidal function we are going to look in this case is going to be that x is equal to a times the cosine of omega times t, which is omega is just going to be our angular frequency in this case. And this is where we can say, well, Corey, why is it going to be cosine instead of sine? The reason why is because if we had sine at t equals zero, our function is zero and our position is zero. So if our position is zero at the initial point, we don't have any restoring force. We aren't being acted on. So we have to move it away from its equilibrium position of x equals zero first and let it go. So this is why we have to use cosine. Because remember, if cosine is zero, you get a total value of that as one. So now with this function, this is how we can say, well, how do I relate my omega here to my restoring force, or in my case of force as well, of the mass? How do m, k, and omega all relate to each other? Well, we're going to look at a little bit later when we actually have springs moving and if we're looking at the functions or the graphs of position, velocity, and acceleration with respect to time, we should be able to determine what is our value of the spring constant and the mass if I knew, if I was able to tell you what that mass was, just from looking at what is omega. So in this situation, I mean to tell you that omega is actually equal to the square root of our spring constant, k, divided by the mass, that whole quantity. So now, what we're getting ready to do is that I've just got this simple ring stand and in front of you, as you might see on here, are just three different little springs. I'm going to bring this a little bit closer. That way you can kind of see that all I've got is just these three different little springs and they've all got different spring constants. As you can kind of tell, these two kind of look similar, but when I actually put a mass on there, you're going to see that they behave a little bit differently. 
So if I put this mass right on here first, it goes down to where it's almost at the end of the screen. But now if I use the second one, oh, it kind of goes about the same, but you'll notice that this one, I've got a lot more stretchier than the rest of the spring itself. Oh, it's an odd case. Now initially with this third spring, you can definitely tell it's a lot more different. And it stretches a little bit farther. So all of these have different spring constants. So now what I can do with this is that below each of these, I can put our motion detector, which we've used in other demonstrations, and I can look at the position, velocity, and the acceleration with respect to time. In fact, let's actually go to the data. Well, as you can see here, what we're getting ready to do is set up for our little data experiment. Right down here, we have our Vernier Go Motion Pro, which is just going to be connected to this computer screen. As you can see here, we have position, acceleration, and velocity graphs, all with respect to time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use one of the springs. We're going to attach our little hanging mass. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set this guy in motion. And now we're going to start our timer. And we're going to stop it. As you can see, it's still going. And as you notice, that if we were to look at, let's say, the very start right here, and we're going to go to another complete cycle, which is going to be about right there, and we zoom in on our position, and we zoom in on our acceleration, and we zoom in on our velocity, we can see with our position, which is what we talked about with our functions, that we started at a maximum position, went down to a minimum, and back up to a maximum. And we said our acceleration should be the negative of that. So we started at a minimum or a negative value, then we went to a positive, then back to a negative, and back to a positive. Almost at the exact same time, where this one's a negative value or a minimum, this one's at a maximum. And what we see here is that the initial starting point starts at zero and goes to a negative value, then goes to a positive, then goes down to a negative. So this is where we can see the relation between all three of those. Now, if we wanted to, we can see what a second spring would do. So now with this one, I'm going to move my sensor. And now I'm going to put this in maybe not that much motion. And now we're going to collect some data again. And again, we still get that sinusoidal function, but it's just a little bit different shape in terms of its amplitude, which means that it's going to give us a different k value or a spring constant. You'll notice that the position still around the same part there. That's because this is recording the position relative to the actual force sensor. And it's not having to do with its own position. We look at the maximum displacement here. So again, if we look at our zoomed in values, from here to about another peak or another complete cycle and we zoom in maybe not that much there we go we auto scale there we auto scale here and we auto scale the last one we can see our changes here in this case is about a total of an amplitude of about 0.01 meters. With this one we have an acceleration that's probably around a total peak to peak around 2 and we have a velocity peak to peak around 0.2. So two different springs giving us two different values but that doesn't mean that the shapes are any different of the overall graphs it just means that their amplitudes are different along with their spring constants. Well, after looking at the data, we can see that the different graphs themselves relate to each other. That the position and the acceleration look the exact same in terms of their 
a lot of shapes, but one just going negative where one is positive. And we have our velocities like our relating factor between those two. Now remember that you're going to start off with that your position is going to be a function of cosine, your velocity is going to be a function of sine, and your acceleration is going to be a function of negative cosine. But there's going to be a little bit of a difference with the different amplitudes uh, because of the change with respect to time for each of those. So I think that is all for this example today. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.